Welcome to the video history of the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists. Today we're extremely fortunate to have with us our interviewee, Dr. Mel Gerby from Chicago. Mel, thank you very much for coming. It's a pleasure to be able to talk to you today. Well, thank you, obviously, for having me here. Uh, we're very happy. Let's begin with a little bit of your history, just so our viewers will understand who you are. Where were you born? I was born in Toledo, Ohio. My uh, dad uh, was from uh, somewhere in Poland, came here when he was 16. My, he was a tailor. My mother was born soon after her mother uh, immigrated to the United States in the early 1900s. And then when she married my dad, she lost her citizenship. At that time, if you married an alien, you lost your citizenship. So she had to become naturalized take the test and she was very very proud to be an American citizen so, and then I grew up in Toledo uh, high school University of Toledo for college and then to Northwestern Medical School when did you first decide you would like to be a physician you know I think uh, it was probably uh, early in high school days uh, I don't think it was uh, very intellectual the decision I think it was fireman policeman airplane pilot and then my mother says, you're going to be a doctor. You're not going to be a lawyer. You're not going to be a dentist. You're going to be a doctor. And, uh, and it, it looked interesting and neat. And I had some distant relatives who were physicians. And I liked what they did. I still don't think I went into it for any really great reasons, although I knew how to uh, be interviewed and say what I thought was the important things for an interview. Why a Northwestern? Uh, a couple of reasons. I, I only went to college for two years. Uh, two years, three summers, and night school. And so I, was staying, I stayed in Toledo. And I was very happy. At that time, there was no medical school in Toledo, although I probably would have gone there. Many of my friends were going to Ohio State, and I, I just wanted to go further. Uh, I just had a feeling that Northwestern was really above a lot of the schools that I heard about. And by that time, my brother had just started uh, his, felt his uh, preceptorship in Chicago and at basically at Northwestern. And I just knew it was a quality, quality institution. And after you went to Northwestern, why do you decide that you wanted to be an obstetrician gynecologist? In, uh, in some ways it was uh, subtraction. Looked at other specialties and didn't like what they did didn't know if I could do what they did. I really did like the balance that we still talk about of taking care of both medical uh, situations, uh, surgical situations, uh, cancer, and intellectually each of these areas uh, offered many opportunities so that if you wanted to deliver babies you could still have the high-risk pregnancy. You could have the uh, surgical aspects of pregnancy uh, in office practice. And I like the idea of longitudinal care. I like the idea of being able to be part of a, of a patient's life over a longer period of time. Now, you finished Northwestern. Northwestern was extremely famous for obstetrician gynecologists at that time. Who were some of your uh, teachers and mentors? Uh, well, I think that also contributed to why I went into OBGYN. Uh, during our sophomore year, we had a series of lectures by clinical specialists in, in different areas. And the group that did uh, the obstetrics were just fabulous. I specifically remember a doctor, an older doctor, and I can't give his name yet, uh, speaking about prolonged labor. And it was a 45-minute lecture, and as the time wound down, that baby hadn't been delivered yet. And with a minute or two to go, the baby was finally delivered. And we all kind of breathed a sigh of relief. Uh, and that was one of the influential aspects of my going to Toby. Uh, Ralph Reese was the, uh, my brother's partner, but he was just a true giant. Uh, he was so nice to me as a student and certainly as a resident because I wasn't the perfect resident uh, intellectually for certain and, and Dr. Reese had this rule he never would criticize anybody publicly he would call you over after the case 
and say, we need to talk about something. But if you did something decent, he just told everybody how wonderful you were. Even when I joined him as, as a partner, he introduced me as his partner, never as his junior partner. Uh, Dr. Brewer was our first chairman. Uh, he was my chairman at Passive in Hospital, but not chairman of the department. George Gardner was the chairman of the department. But the two hospitals were across the street from each other, but nobody spoke to each other. Maybe once a year there was a joint meeting. Uh, Dr. Brewer was the meanest son of a bitch in the valley, and uh, he breathed blue. Uh, he scared us to death, and uh, I only have good memories of him. That's good. Yeah, I, you mentioned Ralph Reese, who was obviously one of the founders of the American right. College, and also the first editor of our journal. Uh, and Dr. Reese, and I still have his pen, and, and uh, pen set at home because he did all his editing in green, in green ink. That's correct, it, and that's why we now have a green journal. The journal was colored green, and he did his, and as you know well, he, I, I don't know what, how many, what he got paid for doing the journal, but nobody at Northwestern was paid. The faculty was all volunteer, and uh, they would, people would come in early in the morning or stay late to do their teaching and to do their writing. Uh, Dr. Brewer was the editor. At that time, Brewer was editor of the Gray Journal, Reese was editor of the Green Journal, and Al got started, my brother Al got started as an editor of SGNO, Surgery, Gynecology, and Obstetrics. So there were three of the, at that time there was more OB and Gyne in, in SGNO. So we had three editors at this little 300 bed hospital, 100 deliveries a month hospital. That's amazing, all those people. You know, our college was formed in Chicago. There's no question about it. And it was formed by Chicago physicians. Now, there were other people like Woody Beecham, Beecham who came in and others. But when you read the minutes of the college, it was a Chicago-initiated program. And you're very fortunate that you were there in the early part. Your brother was there in the early part. And these are people that nobody really remembers. but. It's important that they do be brought forward. I actually remember conversations with Dr. Reese, overhearing conversations, talking about the forming of the college, that doctors needed an organization who, who could really learn and, uh, and have clear relationships with other people, m many of whom hadn't had formal OBGYN training, but were limiting their practices. And that's, I think, one of the things that they looked for in organizing this as, as a college. I enjoy very much reading those early minutes to see questions answered by things like you. But this is, we're talking to Mel Gerby. So once you finished, you indicated you went into practice with Dr. Reese? Well, I uh, was a resident and uh, the, uh, I mentioned Passive Hospital, a small hospital, private hospital. Some people called it the Crystal Palace. Uh, in, in a beautiful neighborhood in Chicago, and I felt that uh, during my time there, I didn't get enough of so-called dirty obstetrics. I didn't get enough of cancer. So I wanted to do a fellowship. And uh, uh, surgical oncology fellowships were just getting started. I heard about a, a fellowship in New York with Martin Stone. And Dr. Reese, went to an uh, ACOG meeting uh, the year before, and I said, can you find out something about this fellowship? Is it any good? And he came back, he says, well, I have to tell you, he says, I know Marty Stone for a long time. He says, but I talked to the fellow and the residents at their hospital to really find out if it's any good. And it's, it's very good, and uh, you should take it. I guess I have to tell you a story. Um, Martin, my father-in-law was an obstetrician in Toledo, basically self-trained, but really a tough guy and a really a good doctor. He had become friendship, friend with Marty Stone, and he talked to Dr. Stone about my coming there. Well, I didn't want to go there for a residency, but when I started talking about the fellowship, my father-in-law talked to Marty Stone. Well, Dr. Reese had already talked to Marty Stone, and, doc and Dr. Stone promised this to two different people. One was Dr. Reese's protege, and one was to Dr. Steinberg's son-in-law. He didn't know I was the same person. <laughs> and I spent the year in New York 
did the cancer surgery, also took care of a lot of septic abortions. That's when, whatever your thoughts are about family planning and abortion, you really learn what, what the real world was like. Uh, I then had to go in the Army with the Berry Plan. And at that time, uh, Colonel Zimmerman was in, uh, in Washington, and everyone said, you have to talk to Colonel Zimmerman and a couple of other people. And, nobody, and I, did, I wanted to go to Europe. But the only way you could go to Europe was to sign up for an extra year, and I didn't want to do that. Dr. Reese calls Zimmerman. Zimmerman and I meet. Zimmerman says, listen, I'll let you go to Europe if you promise that you're not going to sit in the officer's club on your time off and drink. If you're going to travel and learn, then I'll let you go to Europe. And, and then he says, do me a favor, send me a letter. And don't worry about the punctuation and the handwriting, just so I have a, a note. And I went to Europe and uh, in the Army, and I really think the military was a finishing school. I made a list of the things that I hadn't done as a resident. And those are the things I got to do. I think to this day, it's something, it's something that our, our students and residents miss. They finish their residency and they go to work. And they don't have the mentoring or the sweating that we had to do on our own with other colleagues. And you also got to learn about people who are trained at other different, other different places. And so when I came back to practice, and then I joined Dr. Reese and my brother, I, I knew, at least I felt, that if it didn't work, I could leave and go into private practice. My father-in-law had wanted me to join him. My father-in-law wanted my brother to join him. I wanted to be in Chicago. Al is my only family. I wanted our kids to be able to have some relationship. So I joined Dr. those doctors. Friends said, how can you join Dr. Reese? He's such a giant. You're going to be doing nothing but scut work. Well, soon after I joined them, they, they insisted, Al and my brother insisted you take a day off, not for golf or anything, but for some academic thing. That's where I got to work in some labs and do some decent work with smart people. But if I'm not in the office, Dr. Reese might see a patient of mine, and he saw a young woman, yeast infection. He used gingin violet. I don't know if you're old enough to remember gin, gingin oh, violet. Oh, I've used a lot of gingin violet. <laughs> right. right, and Al, of course, used to talk about the, the song, uh, when you use gingin violet, there was staining, this purple stain on everything. Al said, do you, do you know about the, the girl with the purple bottom? She got her thrill on Blueberry Hill. See, I would never say things like that, but my, my brother would. Anyway, uh, Dr. Reese used gingin violet. He knew that Al and I used Nystatin, this new medicine. But he was seeing the patient. He called the nurse in. What does Mel use? He wouldn't use what he wanted. He used what I wanted. So it, it really gave you a confidence to, to be a part of that team. Once you joined that, you've been, how long did you stay in that group? Uh, I stayed in the group until uh, uh, 12, 12 years before I retired. I left uh, Dr. Shara asked me to uh, join the fa faculty group full-time to be head of gynecology and gynecologic surgery. Al had retired a few years before, and I, I felt I was getting to be on cruise control. I knew, how, I, I really loved it. I loved delivering babies. I still get my hands when I start hearing about forceps and knowing that the residents just don't know it. I, I know, you know, I have a favorite a patient, uh, an old father of a patient I delivered a long time ago says, you know, you know what Gerby's law of forceps is, don't you? I said, yes, what, do you know? He says, yes, there's no force in forceps. Uh, but I, I knew how to deliver babies, I knew how to do the operations, but I, I thought our residents weren't getting the teaching that they should get. So I took the job as head of GYN and GYN surgery, knowing that I really had to bring in some people, to bring in the urogynecologist, to bring in better laparoscopic surgery. And I did that for the last 12 years before I retired. And you are now retired? I retired three years ago. Do you do any teaching or any? Yes, I do, uh, I think, a, a fair amount of teaching. I teach third year students. Uh, every group that rotates through, I give them a talk on pap smears, HPV, vaccination, uh, colposcopy. I, uh, I teach uh, sophomores, excuse me, juniors, excuse me, sophomores, second year students, PBL, problem-based learning. I do that every other quarter. It's a, every, other, every other quarter. It's a wonderful, s small group of students. They do most of the work. I kind of guide them, and uh, it, it's a 
it's a wonderful way of teaching. I, uh, I go to a clinic on the west side of Chicago, uh, it's Hispanic and Polish, and see GYN patients. There's no insurance issues there because it's a governmental protection there. And uh, then I am separate from medicine, and I still, Dr. Shara, our previous chairman, Dr. Shara and I meet with our residents who are in gynecology. We meet with them every Tuesday night. Today is Tuesday. We had a both send notes that we weren't going to be there. It's rare that we're both out of town. On Monday, they send us a list. Is today? Monday. Today's Monday. Tomorrow's Tuesday. We, they send us a list of every patient admitted to the service the week before. Their initials, age, indication for surgery, what operation was done, complications, and pathology report. And we go over them in, in real detail, and it also acts as a preliminary QM issue. It's the best conference, teaching conference, that the residents have. It's Dr. Sharon and I, neither one of us are current in the technology, but we both know a little bit about what's going on in hysteroscopy and laparoscopic and the ro robotic surgery and are the, how much of these are really indicated, what about the cost, why did this attending do this operation? Why did you let the attending do this operation? Did you say anything to any? We know that the patients come in in the morning, the residents don't have much say, but it's a way of letting them know what the real way to practice medicine. Let me take you back then. When did you first learn about ACOG? Uh, I would say uh, during residency, early, early on in residency. Uh, I'm not sure when the first, I don't even know, the first ACOG meeting I went to in Chicago, I'd have to look back at the calendars. But uh, I really I have always looked at ACOG as, uh, as speaking for me, but speaking for patients. I, I, uh, I got called once to serve on, an, on the ACOG uh, maternal medicine uh, committee. And I called whoever, I don't know if it was, I think it was Dr. Kamenetsky, he called him, I said, you know, I'm a general ob guy, I'm not a maternal medicine person, I do general OB. He says, that's what we want, we have MFM, we have some specialists, and he says, but you practice at a private hospital in an academic setting, and uh, you're the kind of person we want. It really became a highlight for me, and I, I think that's when I got to see about ACOG. I, I remember uh, a situation when uh, the test started, first came out for AFP, and I think the commercial people wanted to, to get it out right away, and Joe Lee Simpson and, and people in the college says, until you really know what to do with these numbers, you really can't put things out. I also knew that we took care, we, we always talked about the mythical doctor and patient in Buffalo Chip, Wyoming. The doctor in Buffalo Chip, Wyoming, doesn't have access to everything that I have in downtown Chicago. So can that person practice the same way we practice? But the patient in Buffalo Chip, Wyoming, she's reading Red Book Magazine. She's even looking at television. There was no internet. And she hears about some of these tests. She deserves the best level of medicine. And as much as the college meant to the fellows of the college, I think the college looked at the patient even more importantly. And to this, to this day, when I'm at conferences at the hospital and people say, well, ACOG makes us do this and ACOG makes us do that, I said, ACOG isn't out there. ACOG is you. If the, they are the reason you practice decent medicine and you need to, if you have a question, you don't agree, you let somebody know. What has been your most disappointing experience within medicine, Mel? I think the uh, malpractice situation, I think that took away a lot of fun out of medicine. It's the unfairness of it to doctors, the huge cost to patients. I have no problem I, with people being well compensated for medical problems, outcome issues, but out, as you know, Ralph, outcomes don't relate to what was done. A bad outcome means it's a lawsuit. And if a patient needs a million dollars for whatever reason, that's fine. But to give somebody a million dollars, they're only going to get a few hundred thousand dollars out of it. The cost of defending it 
from the defense side, the cost of prosecuting it is ridiculous. I, when I was president of the Chicago GYN Society, I sent a proposal that I said, let's offer to become a panel expert witness, no cost. We won't charge. You'll come in and review the records, not for the plaintiff, not for the defense, but for the court. Nobody was interested. The plaintiffs like the lawyers for sure weren't interested. The defense lawyers, they get paid by the hour. They didn't want any of this. And it's to this, to this day, it's still, I'm not sure I have any solution to this problem, but I think it, it contributes not only to defensive medicine, but uh, it, it, it takes a lot of our good people out of this, out of this specialty. There's no question that it changes the way we practice. I, I totally agree. What would you say on the other side has been the most exciting or pleasant thing that you've had to do within medicine? I, you know, I think the, uh, there's, so, there's so many good things. And I, I haven't had it, you know, I'll leave here and I say, oh my God, why didn't I talk about such and such? I think the, uh, being, a, being around for a while, to, to watch some processes evolve. Uh, the RH story, I, I, you know, I remember the first story of, uh, of uh, amniocentesis and the developing of our rogam, et cetera. Uh, pap smears, the cervical cancer etiology, colposcopy, HPV, and now the HPV vaccine. I think this is a, this sh has the chance to really eliminate a major problem in women's health. Let's think about your career in medicine. If you could do one thing to change the way medicine is going, what would it be? Uh, I think that uh, we, are, we are losing uh, the individuality of a doctor-patient relationship, that uh, we've, we've fragmented medical care a lot. I think the electronic medical record has the potential to improve to improve quality of medical care a lot, but it's not, it's not the whole answer. There's, there's so, I'm, I'm afraid, Ralph, there's just a, a lot of issues that uh, I would think <clears throat> with how many millions of people in the United States that don't have access to care, we need to, we need to pr pr uh, promote some form of a health program. Uh, I'm not sure that, uh, that a single-payer U.S. government situation is the best. I don't know who advised the experts putting together that the last health plan. I'm a believer in it as it, as it is. I think it's a far better, it's a start. Uh, I think the publicity, the so-called death panel discussions, idiotic. Uh, it's, there, there's so many things, uh, but I think that uh, the cost would be reduced if we weren't so dependent on emergency room medicine, if we weren't so dependent on end-of-life expenses, that if we paid a lot more attention to uh, preventive, in so many, obesity, it's just ridiculous to tr try and operate on somebody, try and diagnose something, try and put your hands on somebody who's heavy. You just, you just can't learn anything, so you have to start using more and more sophisticated things. and. And it's, they're repeated 10 different times. And you delay taking care of somebody because they're obese. And they've got the comorbidities because they're be obese. And I don't think any of us are really paying attention to it. Let me take you back into the early days of the formation of what was then the academy. And Ralph Reese and the thing. If you could have put yourself back in that position, knowing what you know now, what would have been the one major change that you would have recommended to them as they developed the American College? You know, I, I don't have that answer, Rao. I think, I think the, they cobbled together a, a really good program. I'm not sure that uh, they, the, the founders of the college, were aware of the directions that uh, medicine would go in the development of the subspecialties. Uh, I don't know what direction it's going now, but. I don't think that the average obstetrician gynecologist, of course, I'm in a big city where there's lots of subspecialists around, I don't think that the average doc should be doing some of the surgery 
that, that we do. Uh, and they're not, the patients, again, aren't getting the best. And the, both cancer, both a lot of the fertility issues. I don't, you couldn't do it. Should we, we've had this discussion for years. Should we lengthen our residency uh, to include these other programs? Should we go into a tracking system? Uh, again, I don't have I don't have the answer, but I these are these are evolving. What the people did in early 50s, I think they did a very good job. I think they did a good job of again mixing the academic with the with the practicing doctor. I, again, I remember a question that my brother did bring up about ACOG. That one of the first things he said, just come to ACOG at uh, seven in the morning, and people are going to conferences. At 7.30 at night, they're going to more dinner meetings. They're not out drinking. This is not a convention for fun. People really come here to learn. And if you don't send in your request, it's the day you get the program. Well, they used to mail the program out. Maybe they still do, but since I'm a senior, I don't pay for it. I don't get it. But if, you don't put it if you don't put down what you want that first day, you won't get what you want. And put down, go by the speaker, not by the subject. Which was more, which was more important. You've mentioned your brother a number of times. Obviously, you had a very close relationship with him. Yes. He was a remarkable person. Also, one of the early developers of the com, of the college. He he was right there when, the fly on the wall, when they were developing it. That was an interesting group of men. And you're right. And they were men. There they were, were men. There weren't many. There women. weren't many women. As a matter of fact. Currently, about 50% of our practicing OBGYNs now are women. But I'm sure if you look in the mirror today at the people on the stage, there's at one time maybe one or two women. And I know it's difficult to get women in leadership roles. It's difficult to have an occasional female president, occasion, but I don't, I, women have different responsibilities. And they're, in practice, they're the ones who the kid, child gets sick they're the ones who usually get called and have to leave. And they're the, they have trouble staying late for a committee meeting or coming in to even ACOG, the committee meetings the week before and the times after. So we tried this in other organizations to change the rules to, to make it easier for a woman to, to progress. And it, it, didn't, it didn't work either. If you given this opportunity, what advice would you have to a young physician that was entering our specialty today, what would you recommend to them? One of the, your students that's decided to become a, a uh, OBGYN resident, what type of advice would you give them? I give them Tom Friedman's advice. His rule that PQ and CQ is more important than IQ. Passion quotient curiosity quotient, more important than how smart you are. And you better, you better have a passion for this, because you have a passion for it, you'll really be rewarded for it. There's nothing like it. Mel, it has been a wonderful pleasure to talk to you today. You're one of the few people I know that has had the opportunity to serve with some of the founders of the college. But more importantly, you yourself have been one of the icons that have helped develop the American College to be what it is today. I know you depreciated yourself a lot, but I know all the things that you have done. Thank you so very, very much for coming today. We appreciate it, and it's been wonderful to talk to you. Thank you very much for letting me do this. I'm looking forward to it for two years now. Yeah. Thank you.